In 1 Peter chapter 2, the first verse, it says, uh, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So if we can, we probably would need to go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 in the end verses so we can understand why he's saying therefore. So let's go to 1 Peter, uh, just go back a page, it should be, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 13. Is that all right? Is everyone still there? Okay. So it reads, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled and set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And so we have to come with the mindset of doing something. Uh, and being in the body of Christ is not about sitting down, uh, being on the roll call and hearing the preacher's message. And therefore, because you sat and heard messages, that does not make you a Christian. The Bible says anybody that believes in Christ must do what Christ what Christ did and has been doing. He said, you shall do a greater work. Well, Jesus didn't sit down and do a bunch of studying. He revealed God's power in forgiving men of sins in healing people that were lame, that were blind and resurrecting from the dead because he was obeying the father. Uh, he defeated famine. He defeated death. He defeated fear. He defeated every weapon that the enemy had thrown at him because he trusted God's word. He obeyed God's word and he put it in action. And so we cannot deceive ourselves thinking because the pastor sees us, the apostle or prophet sees us. We're at every feeding, uh, we're at every uh, luncheon, we're at every uh, appreciation service, every choir rehearsal, but we're not doing anything with what God invested in us. We're not telling our testimony. We're not telling anybody about what God had done for us. We are relying on the messages and repeating the messages that we get on Sunday, but we don't have a personal relationship for ourselves. And so we got to come out of that deception. It's important that we get taught that God calls you to be able to do something. Uh, you can't go to work and just say that you know what the handbook says. Your boss will not pay you. You have to be able to put what's in the handbook in action. Am I right? Or you will get no paycheck. He does not care if you know what rule number one says, if you can recite it five times. He wants to know, can you put it in action? He does not care whether the, you can demonstrate that uh, whether you know that the customer is always right but you have to be able to demonstrate that the customer is always right he doesn't care whether you know the instruction bo booklet on how to work the register if you cannot work it he will hire somebody else and so if we don't do what god will call us to do he will give it to someone else to do understand that god does not need us god requires us to work for him but if we don't do what God tells us to do, he says, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. So God can get somebody else. Is that all right? And so it says for us to be self-controlled, which means we have the ability to control ourselves. We uh, animals respond by instinct. Uh, a dog sees food, it drools, it eats. That's it. Okay. And so animals move by instinct. And we as Christians should not be moving by instinct. We should not just move by every whim of teaching. When we get in fear, when animals get in fear, they defend themselves. And so when Christians get in fear, they're supposed to rely and trust on God, not start defending themselves. Why would he call us? Why would he call himself our shield? Why would he call himself our banner and our rear guard? Why would he tell us to stand still and know that he's God? Everybody hear that? And so many of us as Christians are trying to defend ourselves. We're trying to justify what God has called us to. And if we let God justify us, then he will silence and shut the lion's mouth. Amen. And so verse 14 says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had. H-A-D. Anybody know their English knows that had is not present. Had is past. And it said you had these desires because you lived in ignorance. And so that's why the scripture says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new because God defeats through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. He defeats your old evil desires. He defeats your old cravings. Um, as you mature in Christ, your desires should change. When you first came, some of you like going to the club. Well, you should not have that same desire after a while because he weans you off of that. He delivers you from it. Some people can stop cold turkey. Other people... They have to be weaned. Does everybody understand that? 
And so you have some who have the ability to stop immediately because they love God. And then you have others who don't love God as much, who have to grow to love God. And they can't love a God that they don't know. And so as you teach them more about God and what God has done and what God will do for them, they start to love him more by relationship. You cannot love God without relationship with God. Is that all right? If I was going to tell you to love your father, but you never met your father, that's the reason why you don't love him. And when you see him after 18 and 20 years, well, that's the person that slept with my mother, but I don't love him because I have no relationship with him. And it's the same thing with God. Since we don't see God, since we don't uh, spend any time praying and talking to God or reading God's word, learning about him, it's very hard for us to love a God that we know nothing about. And so that's why we have a church established with people who know God. See, we got people who read about God, who went to school for God, but never been introduced to God. It's no different than somebody reading a good story. So we go to church and it sounds like someone's reading a story, but they're not introducing us to God. He's not being revealed to us. And so if you have somebody that is anointed to speak God's word, then as they speak, God in, God is being revealed to you. And then you see God in places you have not seen God before. So it says that you, you're supposed to have had these desires when you lived in ignorance. We should not still have the, uh, the temper that we had to where we want to fight somebody as soon as somebody says something wrong. We should not have the mentality that as soon as we go through a test and trial, we give up. We shouldn't have to run to drugs and alcohol and weed and sex and all the things that we lean on as crutches. We should learn to rely and depend on God if he is your God. Verse 15 says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. He's not asking you to be holy. He, he wouldn't tell you to be holy if it was something that was impossible. Oh, I can't get everybody to say anything right there. I said, he's not going to tell you to be holy if it was something that you couldn't do. The only way that you can be holy is by receiving his Holy Spirit. And so being holy means one with God. The word holy does not mean your long dress. It does not mean wearing white every first Sunday and wearing your dress to the floor and speaking in King James because you don't speak King James when you leave the church. So all that religious stuff got to get out of your tongue. Okay, nobody wants to say nothing. That's a spirit of religion. Thus is and the is. But when you leave, you say you and you say the. And God says, stop with all the show and just be real with me. See, people don't like people who are just real. How can you talk to God like that? Because God is just as real to me as I am to him. God is realer than the person that you are because you got a mask on. You faking to be something that you're not. And God is who he says he is. And if God that we, if the God we serve is real, then why are we being fake? If the God has a problem with you, God will let you know. I don't, it's, it's strange that this people, uh, these strange prophets are turning God into some whispering little girl. <laughs> God got something to say to them, so God going to tell you, but he's not going to tell them. <laughs> God had a problem with the children of Israel. He sent his prophets. What happens a lot of time, God has already been telling the people not to do something or telling the people that they need to repent, and then he'll send a prophet, but God is going to deal with the person first until they become to the point of disobedience. Then he has to send a person as a witness that that is God talking to them. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? See, a lot of prophets get in God's way, and as soon as they see something, they believe it's their time to speak. But they have to be led by the unction of the Holy Spirit, because just because you see something doesn't mean it's time for you to correct. I said it before in another study. Imagine if Jesus started rebuking everybody that he saw that was in sin. Would he have made it to the cross? Would blind Bartimaeus have been healed? <laughs> would, he have any, would he have even gotten his disciples? Because he didn't even deal with them about their sin. He just said, come follow me. Uh-oh, uh-oh. This is to all you RoboCop uh, Christians that believe that you got to correct everybody every time they do something wrong. You have an insecurity problem and you have evil that you don't want to deal with, that you're hiding behind. And so the way to make yourself look holy is to appear that you say, see everybody else's mess. But you don't have a mirror to show you that you messed up. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. 
And so we have a twisting of what the prophetic is. We have a twisting of what the pastoral is. We have a twisting about what the callings of God are because if you receive God's Holy Spirit and he gave you the assignment that you called yourself a pastor, you called yourself a prophet, somebody, a couple of your friends got together and anointed you and ordained you with the oil that ain't even God's oil. See, what happens is man ordains you, then man can strip you. But if God ordains you, man can't take it from you. Thank you, Jesus. Watch this. So since you call on a father, verse 17, who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. God is not going to... There is a spirit that goes around it just because, you know, we so-called leaders, we think that we can get away with stuff that new Christians can't get away with. And that is false. God says he judges each man's work impartially. And if we are responding out of bitterness and anger, if we are overbearing, if we talk to people like they got tails on them and then expect just because we're pastors such and such that we can get away with that, but God commands all to live in equality, then that is a problem that we have to deal with. God says he judges each man's work partially. So if you lie, I, he don't care if you minister to 6,000 people, you are still guilty as a liar. Oh, wait a minute. And instead of us repenting, we try to justify it with our titles. <laughs> instead of somebody admitting that they were just having a bad day, they were pissed off, you know, they had a rough day, they're going to say that that was the spirit of the Lord telling them to tell you what they told you. But they were really responding out of their anger and they need to repent. That's what we have to do because we are scarring people instead of healing people and nobody wants to come to Jesus anymore. But he said, come to me because I am humble and meek in spirit. When Jesus got angry, he rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he rebuked those who were what? Who were defiling the house of God. He said, my father's house should be called a house of prayer. And that was the one time that Jesus got indignant. And that was to fulfill a scripture that said, zeal for your house has consumed me. And if it's not zeal consuming you, then that's something wrong. It should be zeal for God's house, not zeal for your somebody disrespecting you or what you call your anointing. Everybody hear what I'm saying? It says that he judges each man's work impartially. So God don't play favoritisms. There is no favorite prophet. There's no favorite. If you wrong, you wrong. If you right, you right. But we should stop trying to prove that we right or we wrong and let God be right. And we all be wrong. <laughs> it says live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. So a stranger is not familiar with everything that goes along. Anybody, when you move to a new town, you don't go as round as much at first because you're not familiar with the territory. And so why are we so familiar with the word? We know with the world, we know all the latest songs, 